One of my favorite traditions uh, at Chapel Street Church at Christmas is watching the kids play the bells. And I will tell you from some recent experience, uh, that's not as easy as it looks. Um, but they do a great job. And, and I can remember when my kids were little enough to be doing that and then to um, watch these kids growing up in the life of the church participate in that is, is always so much fun for me. Um, and, and we are now in that season, I guess today is Christmas Eve, Eve, Eve. Um, and, and we're kind of in that last little sort of span as we prepare for family and friends and traditions and, and all that makes up this time of year. And for a lot of us, there's, there's things that we immediately come to mind when we think about Christmas. That, that we immediately think about. In fact, let's do this morning, let's do a little uh, free association. So when I say to you, Christmas, what is the first word that comes to mind for you? And you don't, you, okay, we'll say Jesus, we know that's the right answer, but what else? What are some of the things that you immediately think of when you think about Christmas? Family. Trees, family, <laughs> food, yep, lights, right? What was that? Presents, yes. I was thinking it, I was just wondering who else was thinking it. Obviously snow, we wish, or 50 degrees, whichever, you know, we might happen to get in the Midwest. Right, all of those things are things that immediately sort of are, are a part of Christmas for so many of us. They, they, they flood our, our memories and our hopes in so many ways. In fact, I, brought, I, I thought of the same things you guys did. You immediately think of family, right? You have that idealized version. Everybody's in their Christmas jammies and everybody's loving each other. You know that this sort of euphoria lasts for about 30 seconds on uh, Christmas morning and then one of your kids throws something at the other kid and then the next thing you know it's like there's crying and or you got somebody the wrong present but we we love the idea of it we love the experience of it. of course gifts is a huge part of it i feel like maybe this person overdid it a, a like a little bit like um the family dog could be trapped back there for all you know um we think of eating together. We think of like Christmas dinner and all the food. I mean, this is one of the things that immediately comes to mind for me. I can still picture the card table in my grandma's house with treats and fudge and all these sorts of things that were just at like eye level for a little kid. And it was just perfect, right? I just love it about it. Um, we think about the nativity. We, we think about this story that we've been talking about all December long and the, the, the characters that are involved and the things that that represents and the story that's so familiar to so many of us and yet that we need to be reminded of all the time. Um, and then in about a week or so, we feel a little bit like this as we look at our credit card bill and we're kind of like, what have we done? Um, and, and we're sorry about what the next six months is going to mean for us. And, this is all part of the season. These are all things that we think of. A lot of us relate to these words and, and some of the answers that you gave are the exact same things that immediately come to mind for me today. But in our time together, in and, and, and these few short minutes today, what I wanna do is I wanna look at, at a single verse in the Gospel of John. A single verse where the Apostle John, I think if we were to ask ourselves, where would we go for one verse that seems to capture the significance of what's taking place, of what we celebrate at Christmas? It would be John chapter 1, verse 14. And I want to look at, at how John expresses this, and I want us to talk a little bit about some of the words that he uses when he describes the, the significance and the meaning of what God was up to some 2,000 years ago in a little town called Bethlehem. So this is from the Gospel of John chapter one, verse 14. John writes this, he says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, I noticed that when we played our little word association game here this morning that, that none of us said the word flesh when we talk about what, what we immediately think of when we think of Christmas. 
But as John hears, as he is capturing what, what God is accomplishing in this moment, what he says, what he describes, what he writes is that the word became flesh, that, that the fullness of God, the one who he describes as the word, who, the one who he says spoke the cosmos into being, the one that he describes as breathing life into humanity, the one that he talks about as maintaining and sustaining all of it. He said this very same God took on the limitations and the vulnerability of flesh, of, of humanity to, to the apostle Paul in, in his letter to the Philippians captures it this way. This is from Philippians chapter two, describing Jesus. He says, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, by being made in human likeness. Paul's words there are significant. He, he made himself nothing. Many of you, and, and if you're an adult, are, are familiar with that feeling of, of holding a newborn baby. I remember that one of the most significant moments in my life is, is when that doctor hands to me for the very first time one of my three daughters. And I'm holding her there in the moment and staring at her face. And there's a, there's a couple things that are happening in my mind in that moment. And I can particularly remember this because of that feeling of loving somebody so much that I had never met until that moment. That, that I'd never held or touched or saw her face. It was in that moment, but it was just like, whatever you want in life, you get it right? And you're staring at this beautiful little face and, and, and holding her. And the, the second thing that's sort of simultaneously happening in my mind as I'm sharing in this incredible moment is don't drop her, <laughs> right? Like there is something about the newness of a child that is, is your, fam your familiarity, your awareness of their vulnerability, just how fragile they are in that moment like her tiny little head was still kind of squishy. Like her, her ability to fend for herself was, she completely lacked it. See, if we think about this, if we think about what John is writing from a strictly human perspective, the incarnation to, to us seems like a very bad idea. It, it seems like there's so many ways where this could go wrong for so many reasons, right? I'm on a purely practical level. The, the, the infant mortality rate in ancient Rome was somewhere near 30%. So, so most kids between the age of birth to one, about a third of them wouldn't make it in that culture and in that world at that time. So the, the frailty of, of flesh was, was obvious to everybody. From a human perspective, this, this baby, God in, in humanity, who is all this fullness of everything that, that God is and all of his ability from a human perspective had a one in three chance of making it to his first birthday. A newborn baby can't walk or crawl. They can't talk or let you know what they need. They can't feed themselves. A newborn baby can't even lift its own head. If we follow along in the story of Jesus, we see this vulnerability played out in so many ways. By the time Jesus is approximately two years old or so, he's fleeing with his family to Egypt because there's a tyrannical king who heard the prophecy surrounding his birth and, and felt threatened by it because it declared that a king would come. His family had to leave in order just to escape for their, with their lives. By the time Jesus is, is approximately 12 or so, his family has traveled to Jerusalem and and, and because families traveled in such large groups, they left and didn't even realize that Jesus wasn't with them. He's in the temple teaching for a couple of days before his parents say, hey, has anybody seen Jesus? You know, which that does kind of make me feel a little bit better about some of my own parenting mistakes. Like when you just look at all of it, you think to yourself, God, there's gotta be a better way. Like this, this just all feels far too risky. Isn't there another approach to do this? And, and all of this, the audacity of, 
of God taking on flesh is seen or felt or perceived even more acutely when we see this second word that John uses to describe these events, and that is the word glory. Look again at at John 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Last year, um, just around this time, my, my family and I um, had heard about this park in Lombard called Lilatia Park. Has any, have anybody of you heard of this place? Um, they, they light it up, millions of lights. It's like a city block. And, um, and it's all free. You just walk through and it's, it's overwhelming. So we enjoyed it so much last year that we decided to go back again this year. And we invited some additional family and people to go with us. And this was kind of right after Thanksgiving. And made a whole big thing. It was a Friday night, like the traffic on 38 was, was horrible. It took us like an hour to get there, but I'm totally in the Christmas spirit and I'm singing the songs and trying to like do all this sort of stuff. We stopped for dinner and as we're approaching the park, instead of seeing all of this, this is what I saw. Yep, just that. Total darkness. Like not a single light anywhere. So I'm like, well, maybe it's on a motion detector or something. Maybe we like got a... <laughs> walk in there and and after a few moments one of us decided to like look up their page on Facebook and it said join us tomorrow for the grand lighting at Lilatia <laughs> Lilatia Park and in that moment um, there was a noticeable absence of glory right <laughs> because w- when you see something like that when you th- 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 that sense that awareness that idea of of glory, and this is an important word. If you're a first century Jewish man or woman or child who's, who's grown up in, in the faith and you're learning about this, glory signif- was a significant word. It represents the, the very presence of God. And we saw it all throughout the Old Testament. When, when the people of Israel had to flee Egypt for their lives um, and they're at the Red Sea and, and God leads them across and he shows up as this pillar of smoke and fire that describes how the people were in awe of his glory. Like God was present there with them. When, when they set up the tabernacle and, and eventually the temple, people talked about experiencing the weight of his glory how that resided, that sense, that awareness that God was with them, that he was present with them. And then the longing, the hope, the the, the desire for the return of his glory that defined the way that the people looked forward to what God would do. That one day his glory would be restored. This is what they waited for and they longed for. But when it happened, but, but when the word came to dwell with us, he came in the most unexpected way. It says that he, he took on flesh with, with all its vulnerabilities, with all of the, the fragile nature that came with it, he took on flesh to be present with us. See, because what, what God ultimately sought to accomplish would be accomplished in the flesh. It would ultimately be through the flesh that that you and I and generations before us and the people of Israel would experience and know what God is like, right? Jesus himself said, I and the the Father are one. When he talks about at the end of verse 14, where who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Well, what what does grace and truth look like? It looks like Jesus, we can read the story that people could experience and, and he'd hear him teach and know what it was about because, because he took on flesh and it would be in the flesh, through the flesh, that Jesus would ultimately pay the, pa- the, the sacrifice for, for all of sin, for, for yours and for mine, for the people that have gone before us and the people that, that would come after us. Jesus would cover all of that in the flesh. It's in the flesh through the flesh, that you and I know that we're never alone, that he has promised to be with us and to go before us. See, for the apostle John, when, 
when he is describing the significance and the meaning of all that's taking place, when he describes how the light came into the world, how he broke into the darkness and how the darkness has not overcome so, he says he did so by the word becoming flesh and that his glory was, was dwelling with us. In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew quotes the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. And he said, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, this is the, the gift of Christmas. This is the reason that we take the time every year to re-enter the story, to re-enter the sense of waiting that's defined by hope and in the sense of joy and celebration that comes with God's provision. Because the story tells us that God himself in the most unexpected way, he came to be one of us. He came to be with us so that we could be with him. And it says his name is Emmanuel, God with us. Would you pray with me? Father, today we, we remember and we celebrate and we enter in once again to the story of what you accomplished and in a way that in, from a human perspective, Lord, just seems so wrought with problems. And yet, God, it was your plan to enter into the frailty and the vulnerability of our humanity in order to redeem and rescue us. This is the story of your grace and the salvation that you provide and we celebrate today what you have accomplished on our behalf. Lord, remind us, even today, with all the gifts and family and packages and friends and food and everything that surrounds it, Remind us again that you took on flesh, that you became one of us so that your glory could dwell with us so that we could be in relationship with you. We praise you for this and it's in your name we pray today. Amen.